Inspiration, Transformation, Success Stories, and the Imperfect Action Round, seven days a week. Join Mario Ficini for today's Expert Authority Effect interview. Welcome, Expert Authority World. I'm excited to share with you another VIP guest. Andy Falco has trained dogs the world over. He's a best-selling author. He is an international public speaker, and he's going to be training. He's going to be sharing with us today what it's like to train police dogs. Now, I don't know if you, about you, but I've always wondered, what? how do you get someone to take action with business? That's a person. You can talk to them. You can communicate with them. But how do you do that with an animal? And I remember when I was asking him to be on the show, and he was telling me a little bit behind the scenes, there's a key he was talking about, which you can apply to your business and your prospects and customers. But I'm excited to learn what he has experienced over the last 20 years of training police dogs. So I'm going to bring him up right after we thank the sponsor. How would you like to grow your wealth easier than you think with the change you probably don't notice anyhow automatically? That's why I started the Compounding Interest Snowball, investing with acorns, and advise you do too. Get started simply and easily today at eainterviews.com forward slash acorns. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Andy Falco Jimenez. How are you doing, Andy? Outstanding. How are you? I'm doing a lot better now. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you. How, how's it going? It's good. I'm just so glad to be with you. I, I, I was just thinking while I was waiting to go live with you, uh, about trying to figure out how long I've known you, but it seems like I've known you since you were a kid. <laughs> since I was a kid. Well, I, I'm still I'm still young and right. <laughs> right, right. But uh, I'm just happy to see your success and all of the things you're doing. And I'm just proud to be on the show with you. Uh, and so I, I'm happy to be here. I'm just waiting to hear what you're going to ask me because I have no idea what we're going to talk about. Well, I, I appreciate the kind words, and uh, I, you know, you know what was going on with this. I mean, even everyone watching in the last thirty seconds saw what was going on. I'm like, yeah, Mister Successful, uh, I got one out of the ten things right. But that's the cool thing about this. That's why I encourage people to go live to do th this type of stuff because you get better, and even if you have a mishap, just you know, hang loose with it. So, for I want to know the. I want to know more about your story. What got you into, I was just studying law enforcement for some time. Mm. What made you, what, what inspired you to pursue a career in law enforcement and ultimately bring it around and build a business around it? Well, that's a really good question because it, it was kind of an accident <laughs> to tell you the truth. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, I, I wanted to be a dolphin and whale trainer over at SeaWorld. That was my goal. I, I, I almost didn't think about anything else. I subscribed to scuba magazines. Um, I, I watched, uh, um, Jacques Cousteau, um, uh, you know, every, whatever it was Saturday, I think it was. <clears throat> and, uh, that's really what I thought I was going to end up doing. And then I got into school and found out I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. <laughs> and so, um, I, I love science and I did well in science. It's when I got to chemistry and mathematics that I kind of struggled. So, um, suddenly, um, I, I found myself doing a, a lot of other things. I was a magician. I juggled. I worked at Knott's Berry Farm. I worked at restaurants. And uh, then I began driving buses. And uh, I drove buses to ski areas, river rafting. And when I was doing that, I worked with about three, well, two police officers, one from LAPD and one from Whittier Police Department. Uh, they drove buses on their days off to these to these places. We went to, like I said, Mammoth and Colorado, Utah, uh, river rafting up in uh, Northern California. And on those trips, they would tell me stories about, you know, the SLA shootout that they were involved in or other, you know, exciting events. And I was a big fan of the, the TV show called SWAT and uh, Emergency. And uh, I go, wow, you know, I, I, I get bored really easy. I can't imagine working in an office setting every day. I think I would uh, go crazy. And so as they told me the stories, I became way more interested with each story. And then the next thing you know, somebody told me about being a reserve police officer. I, I, I went to a, a Fullerton City College where they had a class to become a, a reserve police officer. It's essentially an academy and, um, and just signed up and joined without a police department to work for. Um, and then I applied for L.A. County Sheriff, Fullerton City, um, gosh, a whole bunch, probably five different cities. And I went to Anaheim and Anaheim decided to hire me and they sponsored everything that I needed to finish the reserve academy, which at that time you didn't get paid as a reserve police officer. So I went to work for the city of Anaheim as a, as a reserve, reserve police officer for free. And, uh, turns out I loved it. And, um, uh, and that's how it all started. So that it, again, it wasn't something that I planned out in my entire life. It's just that these guys told me a couple stories. 
I thought it sounded interesting. And the next thing you know, I'm uh, wearing a badge and a gun and driving through the city of Anaheim telling people what to do. So uh, that's how I ended up uh, being a police officer. Well, I find that fascinating. I love to uh, go off on a complete tangent here and ask okay. you behind the scenes stuff and ask you what kind of gun it was, but I'm doing my darndest to say, stay focused. <laughs> so that's how you got started being a law enforcement officer. And sincerely, thank you for what you do because a lot of people – I think should have a greater appreciation. I'll, I'll say that. Thank um, you. You're welcome. But what made you want to say, what got you into the, uh, the training of the dog side of it? Because you could have been a regular officer, but you went past that. Tell me a little bit about that story. Yeah, I, I think um, there's a couple of things that are important to know. And that, that is that I, I wasn't your typical police officer. Uh, a lot of people ask me like, well, how did you get into this? <laughs> You should be a fireman, not a police officer. Or they would say, you're too nice to be a, a cop. And uh, because I just, I loved having a good time and I really did enjoy helping people. And, you know, even the baddest, because one thing I did learn, I knew I wasn't the biggest person uh, on the planet. I was only like 175 pounds at that time as a cop. And um, uh, the last thing I want to do was fight with a 200 pound gangbanger that's been working out in the prison uh, for uh, 15 years, <laughs> uh, you know, full of tattoos on his neck and his face. And so I had to learn how to how to use my 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 mouth <laughs> to arrest people. And that means that I would say, you know, Hey, sir, I know that you can destroy me, but, uh, you know, and then I would talk them into putting the handcuffs on and they, and they would. And so, um, I had a different skill set. I think than most people, I had the, the, the gift of gab and the a way of handling these, these tough situations. So that was one thing. The next thing is, uh, my love for animals and still in my back of my mind, I, I think I still believed at some point I would still <laughs> train some type of animal, whether it was whales and dolphins and SeaWorld or somewhere else. And so I ran into the canine unit almost immediately on my, you know, I don't know what exactly uh, where I was when that happened, but I, I found the canine unit and go, oh my gosh, you mean I can be a cop and work with animals at the same time? And I, and I just signed up. I mean, signed up just in the sense that I hung out with them all the time and said, how can I help? Can I wear that suit so I can go get bit? Can I, you know, can I hide the drugs for you uh, on the car? Can I, can I follow you around? And, uh, and early on in my career, uh, as I then went into becoming a full-time police officer, where I actually got paid. Um, my interest in canine was really, um, uh, noticed and I was just passionate about it early on. And so it, I never stopped. And so from that point on in about 1980, Four. I know it's a long time ago for you. <laughs> 1984 was when I became a reserve police officer, and about 1985 is when I started working with the dogs. And I, I was passionate about it, and I immersed myself in in learning uh, about everything I needed to know about training dogs. And then at that point, is I think I, when I realized that training people was way more important than the dog part of it. And so that gift of being able to talk to people and teach people and train people became uh, very handy when it when it came to me helping other police officers and um, administration understand the power of the dog and then teach them how to train dogs. So it's, again, it was just one of those things that kind of just evolved, but it was, it was just my passion for training animals. It, it got me in there first and then training people uh, was next. So I didn't want to interrupt you, but at the one point you, you were, you it sounded like you were pretty excited to go get bet. Yes, I got bit a lot. As a matter of fact, my whole left side is was pretty much damaged by the time I ended. Uh, I, I, you know, the last time I probably took a dog bite was probably only about a year ago. But, um, but yeah, my, but that's why my, you have the protective suit to minimal, min, uh, minimalize that, mitigate that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have some scars that didn't minimize the the bite. I've been bit in places where I didn't have the equipment. Uh, I've been knocked down. I've been knocked off of the back end of a truck on my head. Um, you name it, it's happened, but, uh, cause it's, uh, it's like playing, being a football player. Uh, those dogs hit you at about 15 miles an hour and they weigh about 120 pounds. So, uh, when they hit you with all that power and you're standing still, um, it can take a toll, <laughs> take a toll after a while. Uh, but yeah, that was my life. I, I was, uh, it was awesome though. I did love it. It was fantastic. I remember when I was in law enforcement training, I never pursued it fully, but it was always, I always wanted to help people. That was my driver. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it was FBI, CIA, doctor, lawyer. I mean, I just wanted to help people. Now, yep. some of them are a little bit more action packed than others. But at the end of the day, if you can help someone, like you're saying, the people training, let's talk about that real quick, because I'll, I'll never forget you telling me this. I go, I was trying to wrap my head around it when I was looking into everything going, how do you train the dog? And I'd love if you could share with Expert Authority World what you shared with me as to 
your, your, your success behind it. What, how do you train the dog? Well, <laughs> I know I'm trying to remember exactly what we were talking about, but there, there's a, a few things that are really important to understand. It didn't have to do with the dog. You don't train the dog, you train yeah. the... Yeah, the human. Uh, yeah, but the, um, the understanding the relationship between the two is, is another key component um, uh, uh, between the two and helping the human being understand that it is still a dog. That is really important because there's so many people that believe that these dogs are their children. Now, that's all fine, right? I, I love that they love their dogs so much that they would care for them and, and uh, respect them and love them and all that type of stuff. But you have to be careful that you don't start trying to treat them like a human because they're just simply not humans. I know you think they're human. I know they think you think that they understand everything you're saying. And I know that you think that, uh, you know, they can, you know, do things that are just incredible. And in some cases they can. But just understand uh, always that they're a dog. Now, um, and then the next thing is understand that this dog will never be the last dog you had, right? Everybody wants the, the last dog they had because the only thing they remember from their last dog is that they were wonderful. Uh, they don't remember the difficulties they had maybe in the beginning also. And so uh, I had to often remind people, you're trying to train your dog like you did your last dog. Your last dog was a basset hound. This dog is a German shepherd. It, completely two different things, right? And so as I began to explain that to people, I became more and more aware that my job was to, to really train human beings. The dog part of it was really easy. Uh, uh, at some point, I had enough experience of training dogs that no matter what breed it was, I could figure it out, no matter what sex the dog or no matter what the problem, whether it was aggression or peeing on the, on the floor, those issues were pretty easy to tackle. But when it came to the human being, it was very difficult at times until I really understood how to teach human beings, how to train them because they all learn differently. Um, some of them hate their dog and want the dog to go away and they're looking for an excuse to get rid of the dog. But sometimes I can teach the dog that the, it's not the dog that they need to worry about. It's their perception of the dog. And then after a while, maybe I can even get somebody that hates their dog to once again, love their dog. I have people that love their dog too much and they're not willing to take the, or do what it takes to, um, correct the dog or discipline a dog. So the dog understands what the difference is between right and wrong. So every step that I took, no matter what it was, it, it involved, helping the human understand what steps need to be taken and what their preconceived ideas may be getting in the way of training their dog. So the human part of it was uh, way bigger than I originally thought. And uh, it has become our strength with our company that the fact that we can train human beings um, is the, is the more important thing. And the fact that we can do it makes us one of the better dog training facilities. Uh, I believe in the world. I was I was going to say in the world because I know you've traveled all around it. Why don't you uh, thirty seconds or less tell tell everyone uh, the? Well, actually, I was going to ask you what's your biggest success story. So I'm going to make this a two parter. What's uh, your biggest? I always ask on the client behalf. What's your biggest client success story? And I'll let you add on your biggest success story. And I hope it's the one I'm thinking of. But if it's a better <laughs> one, that's cool too. Okay. Um, so success stories. Uh, your client Gosh. and yourself. There's so many success stories in relationship to dogs, and that's not to be cocky or anything like that. But it's I, not. I, I, I love it when I, the, yeah. the last ten interviews I've done, it's like this is the biggest problem now. It's like, oh man, there's so many success stories. It's like that's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's because our system really works. And uh, as I train our trainers, and I have other trainers now that that work the system, and I just kind of oversee what's happening and make sure that they're staying in line with our with our um, mission statement and that kind of stuff. But um, I, I think. One of my favorites that I remember is that I, a, a gentleman who was a fireman, by the way, he came from Riverside, which is about 45 minutes away from where I live currently in Orange County. And he drives down and he goes, he comes to where we're training a whole group of, of uh, you know, pet dog owners. Uh, and he gets out of his car and during a break, he comes to me, he goes, your name, Andy? And I, he says, yeah, he goes, my name is whatever it was. And he says, I was on my way. Uh, I was supposed to be on my way to the dog shelter to turn this dog in that I have here. He's become aggressive. My wife's afraid of him and we have a baby on the way. And, um, but I love this dog and I, and I know that he can be a good dog. I, I just, I, I don't know what it is we're doing wrong. I've gone to a, a, you know, several other trainers and they can't seem to help us, but we've heard that you're the best. And so I just, before I go and put him down, because that's what the path was for this particular dog, before I put him down, I wanted to come and see if there was anything you can do. And so I evaluated the dog and looked at it, looked at him and I go, it, it just didn't, to me, again, we get a lot of bad dogs. Um, and so 
I said, no, I think we can, I think we can do this. If we can talk to your, if you can talk to your wife, if you want my help, I'll be more than happy to get on a call with her and, and let her know the steps we're going to take. And he goes, I, well, number one, I goes, I don't know how I'm going to go back and tell her because I'm afraid that she's going to divorce me. But, um, I goes, I just can't do it. I can't put this dog to sleep. So, uh, make a long story short, he was able to, to get, um, you know, a, uh, some time, uh, he, he was able to get the dog, put the dog on parole for a little while. And so, uh, seven weeks of training with us, uh, coming to our training, listening, and actually following through with our training. Um, he uh, made that dog a happy uh, a member of the family. Didn't have to put the dog to sleep. They had their baby. They loved the dog. I've gotten messages every so often that everything's fantastic. The dog has gone on to live its entire life and uh, and didn't have to be put to sleep. But um, those are that's just one of, of several stories of that type of situation where we were the last resort. We were the last stop before that dog was going to be put down. And because of that, we were able to build a relationship and, and create a family environment that was able to stay intact. And, um, and uh, I'm getting a little teary eyed because there's, I can now I'm remembering a couple other stories, but those are just, it's so powerful uh, to me to know that we were able to do something uh, that, uh, that saved a life and then create a relationship that was otherwise might not have happened. I would have to agree that that is a true success story because yeah. you got to keep everyone together. Yeah. And the, the child grew up with it, grew, grew up with the dog and knows the dog now is a happy member of the family. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Why don't you uh, g give us a quick synopsis of your biggest success story from one of your clients that, and I hope it's the one I'm thinking of over yeah. in the kingdom of Bahrain. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's are a couple, I mean, I produced a show with Cesar Milan. He and I did a show and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I've had uh, contracts like Disneyland and some other big corporations and, uh, been able to travel all over the world, but having a, like an entire country uh, come to us and say, you know, we did a lot of research. Um, we've watched your videos. We've got your books and um, we've determined that you are the best uh, uh, for us. And we want you to train our dogs <laughs> for uh, the military over at the kingdom of Bahrain. Um, and uh, so we landed that contract. We charged a, a good amount of money for it. Uh, they paid 50% up front. We had uh, a good contract. Um, in place. And, um, yeah, they wired the, uh, the money into our account and we, we landed that deal. Um, and I put a lot of parameters in place because working with, uh, countries and in some countries in particular, you want to make sure and have all of your ducks in a row and a good contract that has limits like 30 day limits, um, has very clear parameters so that if anything happens, you don't get stuck. I didn't want to get stuck with the first 15 dogs that they ordered because each one of those dogs cost me $7,000. You can see that would be very costly, including, and then you have shipping and a whole bunch of equipment and vet bills and all kinds of stuff. Um, and so uh, a great success story in the sense that both, I learned how to be a really good businessman at that point, uh, learning how to deal with a country how to put together a good contract so that when if when and if things went wrong, because I always something is going to I, I used to say always something's going to go wrong. So prepared, <laughs> be prepared for something. Um, and uh, yeah, it just happened. And it, it, we we came out of it very positively. And uh, and it was mostly because of us being very diligent in what it was we were putting together. And then the contract we put in place made it uh, made it a really good story. That's fantastic to hear, because I know a lot of people that you know, I've worked with medium to large size companies and I know other people that work with larger corporations and all that. But when you're like, yeah, I, uh, one of my clients is a country. Yeah. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty cool and inspiring. So thank you. Yeah. For the, for the small business owners, I, the only thing I want to say is that it, it doesn't have to be complicated, right? It doesn't mean that you have to hire 10 attorneys to do this necessarily. Now you're going to do what you think you need to do. Make sure you get good guidance and all that kind of stuff. I, don't use me as a, as a guide to do anything uh, to give you legal advice because that's not my job. But uh, don't, I, I would say don't overcomplicate things if you can help it. But just be very clear of this is these are the stages that's going to take place. This is going to what happens is what's going to happen if you don't follow through with what you're supposed to do. And this is what I'm going to follow through with what I'm supposed to do. And and just keep it very clear. And again, don't try to make it too complicated uh, because then it'll be just the same thing. It'll be so convoluted and complicated that nobody can figure anything out. Keep it simple. I love that. Yeah. So you were talking about your books and video. Why don't you uh, tell us about your books and what you've done with video and if you'd recommend others do the same thing? Yeah, well, how we, you and I met is uh, in San Diego with a, a couple of marketing gurus that we decided to follow. And um, it was uh, during that period of time 
uh, that I learned that how important video, the first thing was how video, uh, uh, how impactful video is and how important it is, especially today. Now, I started doing video back in 2005 when YouTube first started. And even before that, I was shooting with a video camera with a big VHS cassettes in them <laughs> and videotape and then selling those, you know, for, you know, a hundred and something bucks for a, you know, a dog training video. And, um, and so I learned that video was important, but I, that necessarily wasn't marketing. That was just teaching. But now as we come into uh, today's times, um, video recordings and live broadcasting, I think are the key to almost any business, if not every business, uh, their success. If they're not doing video, then you're missing out on, um, an important part of your marketing. And uh, so people can get to know you and trust you and learn about uh, what it is you do and hear you talk about it and hear your passion about it. Uh, I, I sometimes get really excited on camera when I'm talking about whatever it is I'm talking about. And I almost always get con uh, you know, comments back from people saying, man, I really love how passionate you are about what it is you're doing. And that makes me feel comfortable that I'm in the right place um, with you and, and, and potentially doing business with you. And so when, and it, it has to be authentic and real, right? You, you can't be fake or else they're going to see right through that. They can but see the it, screw ups too. Yeah. Yeah. Let them, let them see you screw up. I screw up all the time. Stuff gets knocked off. <laughs> you know, my face gets frozen for a second and it comes back. That's just what it's going to happen. Don't sweat the small stuff. Um, but the video is, uh, is very, very important. Um, and then in regard to the books, that's the next thing that we, we both learn is that writing a book really sets you up as an authority. And I've written nine number one best selling books. I think I've uh, published 20 something books altogether in about 15 journals or something like that. And each time I've done that has not necessarily been not, well, not at all. It's not, none of it's been to make money because of the book, you know, because I've written the book or people buying the book. That's, that's not how I make money. How I make, make, make money is by using that book to, um, put me in a place of authority so that when I, when I go approach a television station or the producer of either a, a television show or a podcast or what have you, is that I say, um, you know, I, I want to let you know that I'm an international number one bestselling author. And uh, I want to, uh, if, if possible, get on your television show to talk about this thing. So I've written a book about a few different things. One of those right now is CBD oil, and I have become a leading authority in CBD oil. I've uh, spoke to doctors, medical doctors in Nashville, Tennessee. I've gotten on podcasts. I've been invited to go on television shows. And, um, and it, it, it's really that moment that I publish the book and become a best-selling author is when everything happens. And now I become the authority in that particular niche. Uh, understanding I've only been uh, in the CBD business for a year now and already I've set myself up as a, as a leading authority. Um, and people will say things and it's, this wasn't intentional, but uh, the last four or five times I've been introduced on a television show, they've said, here's the guy that's written the book on CBD as if I'm the guy <laughs> who created CBD and I kind of look and I got to go, well, I, I didn't write it, you know, and I kind of, kind of play it down. I said, well, that's not, I, I just wrote a book on CBD. I'm, I'm not necessarily the guy who invented CBD or anything like that, but, uh, but the people remember that, right? They remember that's the guy, that's the CBD oil guy. And, um, and it really sets you up. So if you want to set yourself up as an authority, I, I would suggest you write a book and, uh, and become a best-selling author. That was, um, and there's a way of doing that. That's not as complicated as you think. Yeah, I like the point you made there because a lot of people get fixated. I know I get the question a lot with my clients. They're going, well, how many copies of the book do I need to sell? And I, yeah. I swear to you now I'm going to say, well, do you want to sell 10 copies of the book or work with a country? Yeah. <laughs> because I have a yeah. high feeling that you would probably rather have another country reach out to you and have a deal like you did yeah. than maybe 10 or 20 copies sold today. Uh, of your book. So. Yeah, those two books, one of them was the Detection Dog Manual and the other one was Dog Sniff Evidence. And both those books is what is what the Kingdom of Bahrain found when they did their search for me. Uh, a Google search probably in the, in the books at that time came up because um, one of them was a number one bestseller. The other one, I didn't use the technique. So it was th still there. It was good enough because uh, it was a companion book that they, they saw both of those. And um, yeah, and so that's what led to that, 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 uh, that contract. And I'm, I'm again, and the other thing that's important, I was the same person before I wrote the book as I was after the book. So the book didn't make me a better trainer. The book didn't make me uh, more knowledgeable in training human beings in relationship to their dogs, right? The book just set me up as a higher authority than I was without it. Without it, they never would have found me. Without the video, they never would have found me, right? It's because of the book and the videos that I did is what caused people to find me. And I the had books in the videos allow you to demonstrate it. One of my rules is I don't take anyone on that's actually not an expert in authority 
because I know it's just amplifying what they already are. It's not going to turn you into one. You need to be it. But if you're not doing it, you're definitely missing out. So we're going to come back to the imperfect action round and we're going to do the rapid fire questions right after we thank our sponsor. Invest automatically, save for later, and spend today. That's why I love Acorns. I used to think spare change didn't make a difference and saving and investing was an old-fashioned manual process. It's not, and it's a game changer. If you're not leveraging compounding interest in your business and life, automatically, you're missing out. Acorns not only makes saving and investing easy and automatic, it makes it even more valuable by investing with diversified portfolios, spare change, extra cash, and rounding up everyday transactions. You can even set recurring monthly investments in the amount you desire. To make good great, there is also a debit card option that will continue to help you save and invest even further when you spend, plus no minimum balance and overdraft fees. Now, for the cherry on top. They have partnered with 250 plus companies and brands and growing with their found money program to invest back a percentage into your account with the everyday purchases when you shop. Two of which you're probably listening to this right now through an Amazon or Apple device. Get started profiting from your everyday life and business simply and easily today at eainterviews.com forward slash acorns. Once again, that's eainterviews.com forward slash acorns. All right, we are back with the imperfect action round, and I am excited to ask you the first question. Andy, 60 seconds or less, what is the fastest path to the cash you found in your business? Oh, um, writing the book. I, I, it changed everything. Once I wrote that book and got it uh, out there, and it, it, when you talk about fast, I could write a book fast. I could write a book in about two or three weeks, get it published and uh, get it out there, become a best-selling author, and uh, the next thing you know, you're on television. All right, number two, what is the biggest problem you see your prospects making, and what's the fastest way they can fix it right now today? My prospects making. Um, uh, my prospects uh, make um, the big mistake of not vetting uh, their experts and, and following through and implementing what's being taught. The, the implementation, you can learn and learn. You can go to Harvard. You can go to some of the best colleges, universities, and learn the stuff. If you don't implement and take action, it, it all goes for naught. So you have to learn from the leaders and experts, copy what they say, and then implement. Without implementation, you have nothing. I love that. Number three, how do you maximize customer lifetime value in your business? Oh, Wow. I may be stumped yes. on this one. Um, <laughs> Everyone loves this question. <laughs> Say every, the question one more time. How do you maximize customer lifetime value in your business? Um, I think it's something I learned in the academy, and that is understanding that the thing that somebody's approaching you with is the most important thing happening in their life in most cases, and you need to look at it that way. Don't look at it as if it's a burden that you help them with it uh, or that they're just another customer or they're, um, you know, you know, they're just kind of, you know, just another, another name on the, on the ledger. Uh, understand the feeling that they may be having by coming to you that that thing is very important to them and you need to have the respect to talk to them in that way. And that if you do that, the people will stick around for a very long time. Love it. Books. What is the number one book you'd recommend that's helped you? Oh my gosh. Um, look at my bookshelf. There's a couple of them and I, I, the name's escaping me. Um, you know, well done is a really good book. I wish I had a handy. Oh Normally my gosh. I, I recommend it to people. I love well that done. book. Yes, I love well done. Uh, it is it cha and uh, it's it's something that I always think about all the time, and I use it with my kids. I I, I wish I would have used it in my marriage, which uh, is no longer in existence. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it has helped Sorry me in that. a lot of ways be a really good boss and understand. Look for those opportunities that people are doing something right, and don't always be looking to discipline people all the time. And that's the only thing you do. Look for things that they're doing right and uh, reward them for that. No one has recommended that. That's one of the books I've recommended for about, let's say, a couple of years now. Yeah, I love that book. It's a I great see. one. Very good. Well, Thank you. let everyone know where they can find you. What's the best place to get more information on Andy? Well, I just Facebook is a great way. Andy Falco Jimenez. I have a bunch of presents on there. If you want to learn how to train your dog, you, you can find that, Falco Canine Academy. Um, if you want to learn more about CBD oil, I got today's CBD oil. Uh, but Andy Falco Jimenez, I have a, a, a public page or a, a 
I guess a celebrity page. What else do they call it? Public, public, public figure profile page. Yeah, there you go. Public figure page celebrity. Um, and um, you can see some videos on there and things that I've done and whatever it interests you. If you have any desire to write a book, we have a publishing. I know I do a lot of different things. Uh, we have a mastermind group. And so because of all that, if you just want to uh, get engaged and figure out how it is that I can help you with something, I'd be loved. To, I'd love to do that. And uh, just find me on Facebook. And that's probably the best way to go. Excellent. Well, Andy, it's a pleasure to see you. I appreciate you sharing the information. And I know this is a long time coming. So thank you. Yeah. It's been a pleasure <laughs> having you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. All right, everyone. That's it. We'll see you on the next one. Have a great day and God bless. Spare change? How's that going to make a difference? I know that's what I thought before I started investing with Acorns. Throwing change in a jar is not very leverage and time-consuming, but what about all the transactions you don't use cash for? You know, like majority? Acorns not only invest your spare change automatically with roundups, it also lets you add a preset amount to each transaction regardless. It's pretty inspiring to see how quickly and easily you can end up with a pile of cash instead of a pile of receipts. Get started simply and easily today at eainterviews.com forward slash acorns. Once again, that's eainterviews.com forward slash acorns.